evening and welcome to the first in our series of A-Level student webinars for AQA, this one looking at the issues and debates topic, in particular looking at the idea of gender bias. Now there's four things I'd like to go through in this particular webinar. The first one is we'll start by looking at the definitions that occur in this subtopic because there are many of them. We'll then look at the different types of questions that can be asked in the exam for the issues and debates topic. Thirdly, we'll look at something which I've termed uh, the beauty of issues and debates and that's how we can use uh, the gender bias topic to actually improve our year one uh, learning. And then last but not least, we'll look at essay writing and the all important 16 mark questions that can occur in this part of the course. So with that in mind, let's start by looking at the different definitions that occur in the gender bias topic. Uh, first and obviously most important, you actually need to know what the term gender bias in itself means. And I've put a definition for you on screen there now and it says that the differential treatment and or the representation of males and females based on stereotypes and not real differences is what we would term gender bias. Now the term representation in there uh, could be how someone's portrayed through academic research. So if someone, uh, a male or a female sex is portrayed in a negative light for academic research, then the research would be accused of being gender biased. Okay. Um, within that, uh, and there are sort of two broad terms. This is the one you need to know, but I'll show you a second one in a moment. Androcentrism is something that we typically find in psychology. Now, psychology has been a very male-dominated field for many, many years, uh, and most of the psychologists or many of the psychologists that you will come across in the different textbooks will typically be males. And as a result of that, there's a tendency for psychological research to suffer from androcentrism, which is where the theories themselves or the research is focused on a male-orientated uh, view of the world okay so if someone has a male perspective of the world that would be an androcentric view that key term is actually in the specification so you do need that one this term isn't but just so you're aware there is actually a term called gynocentrism which is the opposite which is theories which are centered on or focused on females uh, which is not particularly common in psychology or very uncommon so the one you need to be aware of is androcentrism now, if we delve a little deeper into gender bias, because the, the definition is quite vague in itself, uh, there are actually two different types of gender bias that can take place. There's something called alpha bias, which is when a theory or a piece of research exaggerates the differences between males and females. And then there's also something called a beta bias, which is where a theory ignores or minimises the differences between males and females. So if a piece of research is suffering from a beta bias, uh, they, they're assuming that the findings from a male piece of research apply equally to females. Okay, So two broad terms, and so you do need to know those two as well, they are named in the spec. Now a way to sort of help you remember this, if we think about alpha male, uh, alpha males will be tempted to someone that shows off or exaggerates themselves to make themselves look better in front of other people, uh, so that will hopefully help you you remember alpha bias and beta bias you need to remember in the idea that uh, think about males ignoring females would be a good example of a beta bias okay uh, so use those images if you're a visual learner just to help you remember the two distinct terms so there we have it you've got five key terms that you need and I've put a sixth there as well for you sorry a fifth there gynocentrism which you don't need but the other four you certainly do need uh, those are the key terms that sort of underpin this particular unit so that's our definitions part. Let's move into now the different types of questions that can occur in this particular unit. And I've broken it down into four key types, four or five key types. Uh, the first and the most uh, simple uh, you'd like to think is the multiple choice questions. Uh, so I've put an example of one on screen there. Uh, so you often get at the start of a particular topic a sort of one or two multiple choice questions, uh, which often are actually quite tricky. Uh, then there's the what I would call the definition type of questions. For example, briefly explain what is meant by the term gender bias, typical sort of definition question. Thirdly, you can get a comparison question. These are getting harder now. So explain the difference between an alpha and a beta bias, four marks, quite a tricky type of question. You've then got a sort of application question, although it's not your traditional application question. Uh, so the question on the screen there, it says, explain how androcentrism has affected psychological research. Now, that's not a traditional application that requires you to refer to an extract or a stem, but it certainly requires you to go beyond the question. So it's a much more difficult question uh, than the ones before it. And last but not least, the one that students tend to fear the most, you've got the essay question. Uh, and an essay question that could go in this unit could quite simply be discuss gender bias in psychology. So those are your five key types. 
Now, given that we've just looked at the definitions uh, through, hopefully this first question shouldn't put, pose you too many problems now. The key is that most multiple choice questions tend to be centered on the definitions. And therefore, if you've learned your definitions well, uh, it should jump out at you immediately that which of the following statements describes the term androcentrism. Hopefully, most of you are thinking that it's A, and that would be absolutely right. So theories that are focused or centered on men, which of course was the opposite to gynocentrism, which was the opposite. So your multiple cho choice questions hopefully will be quite straightforward, but uh, try not to spend too long on those. Now, the other four types of questions in terms of this particular topic are quite hard because if we look at, in particular, the comparison and the application question, those would be very, very hard to actually write an answer to unless we knew a bit more about the topic. Uh, so one thing that sort of jumps out at me with gender bias as a topic is you need something more that will help you when trying to answer these different types of questions, okay? And it's not a mark scheme that you need. What you actually need that supplements this topic really well are examples of all the different keywords that you've used. So my big point for this webinar is it's not enough to know what an alpha bias is and learn the definition. And it's not enough to know what a beta bias is and learn the definition to that. You're actually going to need examples of where these occur throughout psychology to really demonstrate and show off your understanding. And if you've got examples, that will help you with all four of the remaining types of questions that could occur. So it could help you with a definition question. It could certainly help you with a comparison question that I'll show you later on. It could definitely help with an application question and certainly help with an essay question. So you, you definitely need examples. So let's in turn just go back to our different definitions. So if we go back to our definition alpha bias, which refers to theories that exaggerate uh, the differences between male and females, there's a famous psychologist that you would have come across in your approaches in psychology topic, hopefully by now, uh, Freud, who is a, a key case of someone who commits an alpha bias. Okay. So Freud argued that there were genuine psychological differences between males and females, and he, he, he spent most of his life researching on uh, and presenting theories on males. Um, his theories also suggest that women are inferior as young girls and they suffer from something called penis envy, and he viewed femininity as a fouled form of masculinity. So you can see that he's really exaggerating the differences between males. He's making males out to be more superior, and as a result of that, that's clearly an example of an alpha bias, so a good one to use Freud. If we think about beta bias, which refers to theories that ignore or minimise sex differences, um, there's loads of examples, but I've just picked a really nice one from biological psychology, one of my favourites, is that biological research into the fight or flight response is actually often carried out on male animals uh, because their testosterone levels are more stable, uh, so they tend to typically investigate male animals. And therefore, psychologists for years and years assumed that firstly the fight or flight response would actually apply to humans, but they also assumed it would apply to human, male and females equally. And we assumed that everyone would, when entering a dangerous or a stressful situation, would fight or, or run away so to speak now what's interesting about beta bias is actually beta bias can have a positive impact so biological psychology is littered with examples of beta bias but what that's actually in turn led to is psychologists taking a more active approach and actually now conducting research into females to see what the difference is so actually you can turn a beta bias around it is a problem in itself but what it often leads to is a really positive outcome because more research is done into females so within beta bias there's actually been a whole area of research now that's looked at females so taylor did some research in 2002 that showed that actually when females enter a stressful situation or a dangerous situation they don't activate what's called a fight or flight response they actually activate what's called a tend or befriend response uh, which is where they're more likely to try and protect their offspring and keep their offspring safe uh, and they're more likely to try and form alliances with other people to keep safe so they're not going to fight or they're going to run away they're going to tend or befriend so because there was a beta bias in the research that's now led to more research which has actually made a positive outcome in psychology and last but not least, androcentrism, which is the the one of the two key terms you needed. You didn't need gynocentrism, so I won't give you an example for that. Um, there are a huge number of examples of androcentrism, particularly in the social psychology units. It's a great key term to know for social psychology. Um, so I'll give you an example on the screen there that the results of beta bias research um, often give a very, very male-dominated view of the world. And if we take an example like Ash, Ash had a sample of 123 male participants, and he just assumed at the end of his study that the results of his work would apply equally to females and therefore that's a very very androcentric view of research so there you have it i've given you an example of all of them and the reason i've done that is to now show you how much easier the comparison and the application the affecting question become as a result of having those examples so if we think about that first question explain the difference between an alpha and a beta bias 
Uh, one thing I really want to point out with the example I've given on screen is I'm really what I'm going to call signposting to the examiner that I'm actually answering the question. Uh, what we learned from the AS exams this year is that the questions are a lot more specific than we as teachers assumed they would be and therefore you really really need to show the examiner that you're actually answering the question that they've asked okay so this question says explain a difference between alpha and beta bias so straight away I'm telling the examiner I'm answering the question I've said one difference between an alpha and a beta bias is that an alpha bias exaggerates the difference between males and females whereas so I'm getting my comparison word in there a beta bias minimizes the differences between males and females you can already see just by knowing the definitions I haven't got enough that is never going to get me four out of four marks okay so that's where your examples become really really useful so I've said for example Freud's work is alpha biased uh, as he exaggerated the differences by saying that women are inferior and suffer from penis envy on the other hand so I've got another comparison word in there the biological explanation of fight or flight has previously demonstrated a beta bias as it would assume assumed that men and women responded to stress or danger in the same way so I've thrown in my example there much more likely to get me my four marks now on that particular question if we look at the second question on the list it uh, outline how androcentrism has affected psychological research I actually think it's a very very difficult question uh, because you have to go beyond the question you've really got to sort of apply your knowledge beyond that actual question uh, so just to bullet point you an answer here, um, I would start by defining it so androcentrism refers to theories that are centered on or focused on mouse I would then give an example, so we definitely need that example. For example, Ash's research into conformity was conducted on an entirely male sample. He assumed that the findings would be similar for males and females, and that's known as a beta bias. And then this is where I'm going to signpost to the examiner that I'm answering the question. This can affect psychological research because it potentially provides a misleading or inaccurate representation of how one uh, sex, females, respond in a particular situation. And again, you can see much more likely to get me my three out of three than if I didn't have that example in there. So there we have it. Those are our different types of questions. I'm going to come back to essay questions later as a whole separate topic, uh, but hopefully you found that useful just on how you can embed examples into your answers to sort of really pick up those extra marks. The next section I want to come on to is what I've called the beauty of issues and debates, and it's how you can improve year one evaluation with your new issues and debates knowledge. Okay, So you can turn what we referred to as a burger paragraph last year into sort of a double burger or a double whopper, whatever you want to call it. I've put two questions on the screen. They're exactly the same question, but one is a year one question worth 12 marks. The second question is a year two question worth 16 marks. Um, now, it's really important for you just to be aware that the number of knowledge marks in both year one and year two stays exactly the same. So there's still six marks for knowledge in year one, six marks for knowledge in year two. Uh, where the difference lies is in the number of evaluation marks that actually occur in year one and year two. So in year one, you were used to essays being six marks for evaluation. In year two, your essays increase. They go up to 10 marks for your evaluation. What that tells us immediately and should be telling you is that the number of knowledge marks is the same, but the depth of your evaluation, I've used the word depth deliberately, increases significantly. Um, so you should really be thinking all the way through this, this year of studies, how are you going to improve the depth of your evaluation because you've now got to get 10 marks for evaluation. And there's potentially two different ways you could do that. You could increase the number of evaluation points you write. So you could just simply write more burger paragraphs. Or what I'm recommending is that you could increase the depth of your evaluation. And I think this is a really important skill for many reasons that I'll come on to later. So let's stick with that question now. Outline and evaluate research into conformity. I've picked a year one topic because uh, I'm assuming as you're all here, you've all studied the year one course. Now, there are many evaluation points that I'm sure that you could come up with for this. Uh, I'm just going to pick out four of the, probably the most common ones I've ever read. Uh, so you might mention the fact that the study lacks potentially ecological validity because the task is very unrealistic of conformity in everyday life. You might mention that the task, uh, the study lacks population validity because it was an all-male sample from America. You might mention ethics, he deceived them, there's an argument he didn't protect them from psychological harm. And you could even, if you wanted, mention historical validity that maybe conformity rates have changed over time. So there's four potential evaluation points you could use. Let's pick on the population validity one for a deliberate reason. So back in year one, you probably would have written a paragraph, or hopefully written a paragraph, that looked like this. So this is a year one style burger paragraph. You state your point, you'd say one issue with the Ashes research is it lacks population validity. You go on to bring in evidence or an example of your point. So you say Ashes sample consisted of 123 male college students from America and is therefore biased. You then explain why that point matters. So this matters because we're unable to generalise the results to males and females. And we don't know if females would have conformed in a similar way uh, on the basis of Ash's findings. So perfectly good point. What you can do 
in year two is actually keep most of your point, but now embed your new uh, knowledge of issues and debates to increase the essentially the depth of your evaluation, show off to the examiner, okay? So we keep our point and our evidence the same, but what we then do is we say Ash assumed that the results of his research would apply to females, which is what's known as a beta bias, where psychologists minimise the differences between males and females, just defining that new term we've learned. This can result in a biased view which assumes that men and women are alike uh, when it comes to conformity and therefore demonstrates an androcentric view of conformity. I'm really showing off at this point to show the examiner that I know lots of key terms from year two. The explain part then stays almost exactly the same. So this matters because we're unable to generalise the results uh, to females and we don't know if females would have conformed in a similar way on the basis of ashes and all I've added in beta biased research just to reinforce my use of key terminology. The reason that going for this approach is so useful uh, in year two, so the reason that writing sort of what we're going to call a double whopper burger rather than a, a sort of standard burger paragraph is so much better, is because essentially you're increasing the number of evaluation points you've, you've wrote, but in much fewer words. Because if you attempted to write more burger paragraphs, let's say you were aiming to write four or five, that would take you more words than it would to embed some evaluation points into your existing points. So the, there is a, a key reason to embed issues and debates like I've done there because it will save you the precious words and therefore mean that you can write more quality content in far fewer words. Okay, and on, on that note, onto the essay writing part. So if you was to get this question in the exam, which is a potential to so discuss gender bias in psychology, the key really is planning the essays. In year two psychology, there are so many essays uh, for you to sort of get your heads around that I would strongly suggest you don't try and write every single one of them out and, and wrote learn them because it, it just won't happen realistically. So what you need to have in your mind is a really solid plan of every single essay in terms of what would I include. So if this question come up, if I've never written gender bias before, how, how would my essay look on paper? So just to give you an example of that, given what we've sort of covered in this particular webinar, you can already see that in terms of knowledge, I might define the term itself gender bias. I might define alpha bias and put in my example of Freud. I might then define beta bias and put in my example from biological psychology and the fight or flight pathway. Um, and then I could, if I want to really sort of show off my knowledge, link it to androcentrism just to sort of make sure I'm getting all four key terms in. In terms of evaluation, now I've not covered evaluation in this particular webinar, uh, but you, there are points you could use on the basis of what we got. You've got the idea about Freud presents a really negative perception of women. So alpha bias can actually lead to a really negative perception of different sexes. You've also then got the point from the beta bias example that actually biological psychology has up until now presented an incorrect view of fight or flight and actually through the beta bias we now know that actually uh, females don't respond in the same way as male, males when it comes to a stressful or dangerous situation so we can use that knowledge again there. In terms of strengths what it actually then does is promotes equality in research so just because something's beta biased and that, that can be seen as a negative thing that has actually led psychologists to develop a whole host of strategies that we can now use to make sure research is more uh, equal in terms of researching males and females, and that's a really good thing. And there's a whole area of psychology, which I, I don't know too much about myself, feminist psychology, which you could bring in if you wanted. But the first three points, without actually learning specific evaluation, we can actually use our knowledge from uh, what we've just covered to actually bring in some evaluation and some discussion around the question. Okay. Now, I've actually done that for you, so you don't need to do that, and I'm not going to read you the whole essay. Um, I've written an essay for you, a sample essay, uh, which has been written by myself, checked by uh, different examiners, and we've agreed what we think that that could be a Mark Band 4 essay. What we've tried to do is write the essay in 550 words, because we think that's about the maximum number of words you could realistically write in 20 to 22 minutes, if you had the time. Okay. Now, I don't suggest you, for one minute, you try and wrote, learn, or memorise my essay, because actually, I think you could do a better job of writing it into your own words. So I'm going to provide you with that essay at the end of this webinar, but I think there's four key tips to take away, uh, and it's certainly not just wrote, learning my one, because... It, it might be way too much for what you'd want to write in the exam and you could probably condense some of my quite waffly points down. So the first point is actually turn that essay into a bullet point plan. So actually look through it, highlight the bits that you think are relevant and then take those out and turn it into a bullet point plan. From that, you definitely want to practice writing essays in 20 minutes. There's no point, in my view, of spending hours and hours constructing beautiful essays that end up being 600 words, 700 words long, because actually you're not going to be able to write that. So when it comes to actually writing an essay, practice really trying to write them within the 20-minute time frame, okay? 
when you look at a sample essay, look at the evaluation points I've written because actually they're quite sort of theoretical and try and turn them into much more simple evaluation burger paragraphs of your own. Okay, I've written this to really be a teacher model essay, but actually you can look at the sample evaluation and say, right, let's can we actually make this a much more simple but still effective point. Okay. Also, the reason we put examiner commentary on there really is so you can look at it and actually understand why certain points are effective or why in some cases certain points are not effective and that's equally important. Although we've tried to provide you a mark band four essays, they're not perfect essays, okay? Uh, and no one knows what a 16 mark essay looks like because no one sat the exam yet. So the examiner commentary is there so you can see that actually although this is a good essay, there is still room for improvement, okay? Now we're going to provide you with one after this webinar, but just so you are aware, Tutor to You have produced a whole series of resources for issues and debates, of which there's seven in the set. Uh, they are available to purchase, so we provide the webinars for free, but if you really, really want to get a set of the uh, the sample essays, you can buy them, and I believe they're seven pounds only. Uh, so it's a pound an essay if you do want to get a whole set, but don't buy them with the intention of rote learning them, because that's not the purpose of them, okay? What I've also provided you with, just so you can do a bit of work in your own time, is sort of a summary handout where you can actually apply all of the concepts we've learned today. And there is an answer sheet that will follow that, but not for a week's time, because I don't want you looking straight at the answers. So it's really a handout just so you can actually conceptualise and put all your knowledge down on paper and make sure you understand the key concepts for today. And that's it. So we've covered that in just about 20 minutes. Hope you found that useful. Do please sign up for the future webinars. We've got two more coming up in the month of December. Uh, follow us on Twitter to keep up to date with us and do join our student Facebook group. If you've ever got any questions, you can ask them in there and one of the teachers that works at Tutor will try and get you an answer as quickly as possible. Hope you found that useful and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.